It's great to see everybody back here this morning. Thanks for returning for day two and also welcome or welcome back to those of us who are joining by web. A couple of recent announcements for those of you who may not have been here yesterday. My name is Melissa Perry. I am the co-chair of the Emerging Sciences for Environmental Health Decision Making Committee along with my fellow co-chair Kimberly Buckelhide is who is Kim uh, Buckelhide who is here. And also, uh, <coughs> sorry, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, also, I uh, served on the organizing committee for um, this workshop, and s for those of you who are here, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we do have a break. Uh, it's not on the program, but it's from 1025 to 1045, and also we wanted to put in a save the date for our next workshop, uh, March uh, 6th through 7th, 2017, Enabling Inference-Based Decision-Making, Predicting versus Observing. And I also mentioned that the proceedings of this workshop are planned to be available in um, early 2017. So keep your eyes out for that. So I wanted to recap from uh, yesterday and the provocative content and really interesting <coughs> presentations. And I thought I would start first with a vision of a beacon because that's very much what the purpose of this National Academy of Sciences Emerging Science Committee is about, and that is to shed light and to provide guidance on intersections of science, scientific technology, and capabilities that may not be fully realized yet, but that are on the horizon. So that's the beauty of the committee. I think that's one of the um, very stimulating aspects of what it is that we do. Um, so it's, it's up to us to bring focus as to what is on the forefront and what needs to be better aligned and connected. And so as we think about the information and perspectives that were presented yesterday, I wanted to remark on a couple of themes. I wanted to return to the theme of causality. And I know I started my remarks out off yesterday um, mentioning causality. And it's been a very controversial and heavily debated topic in the field of science as far back as Aristotle. Aristotelians would argue that there are different forms of causality. And in order to be assured that there's a connection between a, a cause and effect, it has to take four different forms. With that came a lot of disagreement and challenge as to whether or not those four forms were legitimate and valid. And so came the 17th century philosophers such as Thomas Hume and also Immanuel Kant. And Hume um, actually said that causality can't be known, only the observation of two conditions can be described. And soon after, Immanuel Kant said, causality is a condition the mind imposes upon nature. Um, in the 1900s, physicists asserted that they would not tolerate any kind of metaphysical explanation as to a cause and effect, but rather um, only what could be observed. And from that came a very strong influence in scientific thought around positivism. And that continues actually today in my field of epidemiology. There are some that strongly believe that um, we could never prove causation, that we're an observational science, and that in fact what we are suited to do with our tools is to simply observe associations. And so the question is here, much of the data and information that you've seen, the disciplines that are coming to the fore around personal monitoring and personal exposures are observational. We can go into the laboratory and take our monitors and demonstrate if we manipulate exposure to particles, the monitor gives us a reading. But when we bring it into the field and rely on others to use it and to, um, in real time, report back those data, the question of how representative is it, how accurate is it, comes back into bear. So with that, some questions as we reflect on um, what we heard yesterday. Uh, Michael Snyder, Edmund Cito, Michael um, Heimbander, and Gabriel Wong Perotti all provided compelling examples of different types of devices that are available to us for personal monitoring. And they're intended to measure exposures. And the question becomes, how linkable are they to health conditions? 
uh, thankfully to Michael Snyder and David Ewing Duncan's own self-experimentation that provided a very um, poignant and insightful perspective on in real time exposures and impacts on actual individual health conditions among our ends of one. Um, and thanks to Michael and also David, Michael from a experimental perspective, David from, as he said, a storytelling perspective, but as part of a long tradition of self-experimentation among scientists, thanks to them, they're giving us context and insight, somewhat anecdotal, but context and insight into how individuals are getting exposed, how individuals are interacting with their environments, and how it's directly affecting their health conditions. And Michael did reassure me that he didn't deliberately infect himself with flu, <laughs> that he just had to hang out with his kids long enough, and by there he was able to uh, find himself um, the, uh, experiencing an infection. So we have measures, as demonstrated yesterday. Feasibility. Um, Edmund, Michael, Gabriel, they all de demonstrated how feasible these measures could be. Edmund's putting um, dosimeters on uh, folks in various locations, including in California. Um, Michael Highbunder is um, obviously asking many people to sign on and make measures available in real time in New York. And then Gabriel went into public libraries in Pittsburgh and asked, would you make use of this air quality monitor and how does it influence your behaviors at home? So there's a pretty strong, compelling demonstration of feasibility that some people will use these monitors and data can be collected. And how about generalizability? And those were issues that were brought up today. I'm hopeful that we will continue to discuss them. I mean, yesterday, I hope we'll discuss them today. And that is, will everybody be able to use um, such devices? Will everybody want to use such devices? Will those individuals that are in environments that are most disproportionately exposed to hazardous substances, will they be able to use such devices? Will they have access to them? And the term um, digital divide was mentioned yesterday. And I too hope that today we'll be able to talk about the, the why. Why would individuals be motivated to use them? At the same time, as you, I'm sure you noticed, much of the content yesterday was about uh, air pollution and particles. And in part, that relates to how much easier it is to measure particles than it is to measure things like metabolites in blood and urine. And also because of the very long history that environmental health sciences has had in thinking about air pollution and air quality. So our measures are much farther along than they are with other environmental exposures. So the question of generalizability to other chemicals, I think really needs to be looked at carefully. We heard from Phil Brown about um, his environmental justice work where there's an oppor opportunities to look at persistent organic pollutants. Um, we heard about um, water uh, quality monitoring and discussed the possibilities of in real time easy devices that people could use in their home beyond um, monitoring air quality to assess environmental exposures um, in their environments. So that, it remains to be seen as to how generalizable. You've heard about lab on a chip, and clearly there's strong movement toward an ability to capture other chemicals and other exposures. I know of a lot of work in the area of, of pesticide exposure, uh, mainly in occupational contexts, but certainly applicable to environmental contexts as well. So, while much of our discussion was related to air quality, we also heard from David Ewing Duncan, who had, over his experience of experimentation, has had something like a 1,000 environmental exposure measures. So the capabilities in the lab truly exist, and you can immediately see how there can be an intersection with the promise of the exposome in that can we make sure that fast, reliable, dependable um, environmental exposures are available uh, um, across the country and easily available to, at the population level rather than um, within the confines of just a couple of laboratories. And then finally, impact. And that leads me into the further discussions for today and why I bring up causality. 
Uh, it is not just to equivocate about minute um, esoteric questions of uh, whether or not the data are right, but rather if the data aren't right, it's not going to have much of an impact. We're not going to be able to um, definitively show linkages between this environmental exposure, this perturbation, and this impact on health conditions, which is really what this is all about. Um, very much what the committee is all about is to ensure technologies are being leveraged in ways that can directly inform environmental health decision making, both at the individual level and also at the regulatory level. So that is a very brief recap of yesterday. And with that, I'm very happy to turn things over to Kimberly Thigpen Tart, who is with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and also is a committee member in organizing this work workshop. Kimberly.